in a lab setting, measurements are performed using a number of different instruments that can measure the different properties that you can see in a lab. Things like mass, volume, as well as distance and temperature. Each one of these measurements has a different instrument used to measure them. Many times, there are separate pieces of equipment used for the same measurement. In the case of volume, you can measure things very precisely with a narrow graduated cylinder or very, very generally and imprecisely using a beaker. To measure a volume, a beaker should never really be used as it's very inaccurate. It just gives you a general idea of what the volume is. This experiment focuses on measuring a lot of different individual components and then using those to calculate the measured and calculated property of density. In a lab setting, you measure a lot of different things using different pieces of equipment and instruments to measure the exact uh, property. Measuring mass, measuring volume, measuring length, temperature, and even light are things that you can measure in a lab. While many times these uh, pieces of equipment have a digital readout now uh, wh where you can see the numerical value of the measurement. A lot of older pieces of equipment or just general pieces of glassware do not have a digital readout. And these pieces of equipment need to be measured using a scale. Just like using a ruler, a scale will have individual numerical values separate it by subunit sections, usually in the form of lines or small dashes. In this example, there is a red line drawn all the way through between one centimeter and two centimeters on this scale. The mark is between one and two centimeters. It is more than one centimeter and less than two. On scales, the markings in between are one-tenth of the unit itself. Each of these markings is 0.1 centimeters. Moving along the scale, the red mark the red line is between 1.6 and 1.7 centimeters. The last digit in a, a measurement using a scale is an estimation. You can read between the scale divisions to give an educated guess as to what the exact value is of this line, what that exact measurement is. You can only really read a scale or estimate to the nearest tenth. It would be very, very difficult for me to say this is a measurement of 1.6288754 centimeters. Impossible for uh, a human to do that just by looking at the scale divisions. But in general, you can be able to, or you're able to read uh, about 10% here or there. My estimation for where I drew this line is at the 1.63 centimeter mark. But again, this is an approximate measurement, that last digit, the three, is somewhat approximate. It could be 1.62, it could be 1.64. The last digit is your educated guess. 
And this is even true in digital scales or digital equipment. Uh, it can only be read to a certain level. The electronics, the computing power can only read it to a certain level where the last digit is the equipment's educated guess. When you're going through and measuring things in the lab, you are measuring a specific property. You are measuring something. And that something would have units associated with it. Uh, typically in lab, you can measure things like distance or length, uh, mass, how much something weighs, the volume, how much space does it take up, uh, the temperature of something, and there are specific units that are associated with these types of measurements. In science and in chemistry, uh, the metric system is used where you're looking at meters, grams, and liters and using the Celsius temperature scale. All of the, the metric system is based on powers of 10. The other specific thing about units is they can vary. You can have a mass that can be correct, but listed in multiple different units. 1,000 grams is one kilogram. That is the same amount, but they are different units. And converting back and forth between units is something that is done in chemistry a lot, where you're going between grams and moles, which will be covered a little later, uh, milliliters and liters, grams and kilograms, milligrams to grams. You're converting a lot using the metric system. And the prefixes in front of the base unit name tell you the exact ratio of one unit to another. So you will use these many times both in the lab and the lecture course to convert between different units. When you take a measurement in a lab setting, you're also recording the numerical values. Uh, as I had just mentioned, you're going through and recording the value to that last digit, that educated guess of uh, significance. Different equipment can give you a different level of, of significance. So in the case of the videos that you'll watch uh, later, you have triple beam balances, which can give a precision of 0 0.01 grams, centigram balances giving precision of 0 0.001, and a digital analytical balance, which can give a precision of four decimal places out to 0 0.0001 grams. The different uh, instrument or different piece of equipment that you use to measure out something plays a role in the overall calculations that you're going to perform later on. You should always record the exact level of significance that the piece of equipment is giving you. If you have an analytical balance and it gives you a mass, one point one, five, six, seven grams. That is the number you record. You should be recording all of those digits. All of them are significant. They should never be rounded off uh, when you're recording. You just threw away the answer by cutting it off and rounding it. The other thing 
when you are recording data from an instrument or from a piece of equipment, you, uh, as I mentioned, you need to include all of the digits of significance. This also includes the zeros afterwards. If the balance reads exactly 1.5000 grams, this is what you should record. Each one of those digits are significant. By recording the zeros, this shows that that value is known all the way to that level of precision. If you were to record 1.5 grams only, that means it could be anywhere from 1.49, 1.51, anywhere in there. Uh, but by recording the zeros, the level of significance and that precision is known specifically. Um, there are rules when performing calculations, uh, when you're adding or subtracting, the significant figures go by the lowest number of decimal places. And when multiplying and dividing, the significant figures of the answer goes by the lowest total number of significant figures uh, of the two numbers you would use. Good rule of thumb for most uh, in lab settings when you're going through and actually doing some calculations, two to three decimal places is a very good uh, start. But in the lab course, there will never be any value that has less than two significant figures. So this uh, experiment is about density and measuring things in the lab. Density itself is based on two measured properties or two measured amounts, mass and volume. Uh, mass is, you. Uh, measured using scales or balances given in units of grams or kilograms. And as I had mentioned, there are different levels of precision to the different balances. There are small kitchen balances or the triple beam balances like will be shown uh, that have a level of precision out to two decimal places. And they cost a kitchen scale 20 bucks, not that expensive. However, there are precision digital microbalances that can measure a mass out to the nearest 0 0.0000001 grams. And these balances can cost well over $20,000 to give uh, to give the person that level of precision, that level of confidence that this is the exact number, the exact answer. Because some of these balances are rather expensive, you should always be weighing something in a container. Uh, you would never weigh a pile of salt directly on the kitchen scale. You would put it in some sort of a container. And by doing that, you would have the mass of the empty container, add the salt, and then by subtraction, you can obtain the mass of salt. In lab settings, this is also true. You would use either small beakers or weighing pans, weighing dishes, which are small containers of plastic that are disposable, or even weighing paper, which are just squares of wax paper. In the analogy I just put out with uh, the salt, that was weighing by difference. So the beam balances that can be used in some labs are manual. And many things can affect the actual sensitivity of that, things like temperature or humidity of the air. Typically on an analytical balance, that can be accounted for by pressing the tear button and zeroing the balance. 
So that way at the very beginning, it reads exactly zero to its appropriate level of, of significance. That way you can then place your empty container on it, obtain the mass, place your sample in the container, and subtract the two to weigh by difference and uh, obtain the mass. For these older beam balances, uh, because they're manual, there's usually a little dial on one end that you can turn, a little screw that will adjust it ever so slightly until the entire beam is level and balanced. But because that uh, can change based on temperature, humidity, and various other factors, that is very, very tedious. And weighing by difference in these cases can uh, be quite time-saving. Uh, time by measuring an empty container and obtaining the mass, adding what you want to measure inside the container and obtaining the combined mass, and then subtracting the two, you can figure out the mass of what's in the container without uh, the error associated with it. Each of the, those two measurements, both the empty container and the combined container and mass will be off by some amount. But when you subtract them, the amount that it's off by, that error amount cancels and you're left with the correct uh, mass. The second uh, property or value that's being measured in this is volume. And volume can be a little bit trickier to measure, where using the mass, uh, you can have a solid, you can weigh it uh, in a container, or a liquid would definitely need an empty container, add the liquid, subtract the two to obtain the mass. To measure the volume, uh, there are two different ways that can generally be done based on the phase. So with a solid, if it's regularly shaped, you can use the geometry. You can use uh, distance measurements in three dimensions and use uh, the geometry to figure out what is the volume of that object. If it's the volume of a, of a cube, so that's length times width times, times height, all in the same unit. Something like a cylinder would be the area of the circle times the length of the cylinder. So the, for the area of the circle, it's pi r squared, and then times the length of the cylinder itself. Notice that each of these units, so in something that's length times width times height, the unit typically is centimeters. And when all three of these are multiplied together, centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, that would give a unit of centimeters cubed. Many times in hospital settings or in the medical field, you might hear them refer to CCs. This stands for cubic centimeters. And one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. When measuring the volume of liquids, they need to be in a container. Otherwise, they will spill everywhere. And there are different pieces of glassware in a lab that can hold these liquids depending on what you're actually going to be using it for. Uh, the cases of beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks, these are really just to hold the liquid. They do have some volume measurements on them, but they are very, very, very inaccurate. Uh, they are just for rough approximations and basically just not for precision level work. 
Um, really, if something has a wide base, if something is very wide, it's not going to give a very accurate volume reading based on the height. However, if it's very narrow, smaller changes in volume would give a higher or a, would give a longer distance of height, which can be measured more easily. And these are the cases in the, in, uh, the case of graduated cylinders and pipettes and burettes. They're tall and narrow, so that way small changes in volume uh, create a larger change in the height of the liquid in the container, which can be more accurately measured. Burettes and pipettes in particular have volumes that are read in more of a unique way. Burettes and pipettes are used to determine how much volume leaves this container. So you would fill a burette or a pipette, and when it's filled, the reading itself on the burette is zero. This does not mean that there is zero volume in the burette. This means that there has been zero milliliters that have left the burette. Uh, burettes and pipettes are designed to measure how much volume you add to another container very precisely. So in this case, uh, in the picture here, Zero is at the top, and as the volume is drained out the bottom, the volume level decreases, and it's left with 19.70 milliliters as the final volume reading. That means the volume that was added to the container below was final minus initial. 19.70 minus 0, 0.00. This is why burettes are easier when you fill them up to the exact zero mark because that way the final volume is the answer or the final volume reading is the answer. Um, but it doesn't have to be. This volume could have started at exactly 18.00 and drained to this volume, to this uh, amount. That way, final minus initial would give a volume of 1.70 milliliters. With these glass pieces of equipment in lab, you can see that, or many times you can see that water in particular rides up the sides. It rides up the edges of these narrow containers. And this is referred to as the meniscus. So when you're looking at a scale and reading a volume level, you are looking at the bottom of the meniscus. You want to look straight on so that way it's even and you can look at exactly where the volume level is at the bottom of that uh, surface deviation. So in this experiment, you're looking at measuring mass and measuring volume in order to calculate density. Density itself is a ratio of mass over volume, or it's the mass that can be contained in one unit of volume. And this property is characteristic for pure substances. Copper will have the same density no matter how much copper you have. It will always be the same. Uh, in lab settings, again, you're measuring the mass in units of grams. You're measuring the volume in units of milliliters. And if the density is mass divided by volume, then the unit of density would be grams divided by milliliters or 
grams per milliliter. Um, as I said, you're taking a ratio, or you're measuring these two, me or taking these two measurements, and the density is a ratio between these two. So as you go through this, you're going to be calculate, you're going to be measuring mass, you're going to be measuring volume, and you're going to be calculating the density of different objects. Measurements can have variability associated with them. By taking one measurement, recording it, and reweighing the same object again, the mass is slightly different. In labs, multiple measurements of the same object are made, and statistical calculations are performed on these to determine an average and correct value to the appropriate level of precision. When you perform a number of different uh, measurements, there can be statistical calculations that can be done to see what is the actual value. There are a number of things in a lab setting that cause a lot of variability. Uh, temperature, humidity, the fingerprint on the balance, these are things that can cause a little bit of deviation. So doing statistical calculations from a number of different measurements can give a more accurate uh, picture of the final value. So first off, some of the, the statistic calculations that you're going to be doing in the course, you're going to calculate the average. So that would just be taking multiple measurements, adding them all together, and dividing by how many measurements you actually had taken. So you're looking to see the sum of all of your measurements of the same thing, divide it by how many measurements uh, you actually have taken. And that will give you one average value. Deviation is something that is specific for each trial. You're looking to see how far away from the average are your individual trials. So trial one, in this case, the average value was 4.676 grams. Trial one is slightly smaller than that value. That, we, that means the deviation of trial number one is negative 0.007 grams. It is less than the average. Deviations themselves, or these individual deviations of multiple trials, can be either positive or negative. But in either case, you should always include the unit itself. These are deviations of grams. So when performing a measurement or even uh, performing these calculations, the units carry through throughout the entire uh, throughout all of the calculations that's also true in the average deviation so when you have uh, the individual deviations the average deviation is very similar to what it sounds like you're summing together all of these individual deviations and taking an average however you're looking to see um, the variability of your answer. So you've taken, in this example, three measurements. Some are off in the negative direction. Some are off in the positive direction. The variability can go in either direction. And so, to take the average deviation, you are looking at the absolute value. The average 
of the absolute value number. So negative 0 0.007 just is positive 0 0.007. Positive 0 0.036 is positive 0 0.036 and so on. And you take these positive numbers and obtain an average. In this case, 0 0.024 grams, the average deviation is plus or minus 0 0.024. That's the variability. That is uh, approximately where the mass ends up being. It, the average is 4.676 grams plus or minus one, or I'm sorry, plus or minus 0 0.024 grams. So the actual value would be within that range. You're accounting for the variability. The last calculation or the last statistical measurement is the percent error. And this is something that you can only do if you know the true value, if you know the actual theoretical number. Uh, in many cases, if you have an unknown, it's an unknown. You don't know what the correct answer is, so you can't get a percent error. But if you do know the correct answer, you can figure out how far off is your measured value versus the correct value. And to do that, the percent error is the measured value minus the true value, all divided by the true value times 100%. So in the example that I ju had just went through, I measured an average value of 4.676 grams, but let's say the true theoretical actual value is 4.660 grams. They are not identical. There is a small amount of error associated with that. And this is to show how close you are to the correct value. So with the average deviation, this is giving the level of precision, how close your measurements are. And with the percent error, you're given the accuracy. How close to the actual correct value are you? The property of mass is measured using balances or scales. These different types of balances can measure the mass of a substance up to a differing level of precision. Beam balances such as these can only measure uh, the mass out to a range of 0.01 or 0.001 grams while digital analytical balances can measure the mass out to four decimal places and give a higher level of precision. In the lab itself, you're going to be obtaining a number of different measurements of both mass and volume and calculating the property of density. You'll also be working through this a few times in order to look at the different statistics of these measurements, looking at the average and deviations and average deviations. You're going to be measuring both mat, uh, the mass of both solids and liquids in the labs. To measure this mass, you're going to be using either triple beam balances as pictured here, where you can measure out to 0 0.01 grams. And also you'll be using centigram balances, which you can measure the mass out to 0 0.001 grams. Both of these types of balances are beam balances. And that means you'll be w measuring the mass and determining the mass of the object or the liquid by difference. For the volumes, you're going to be using graduated cylinders and burettes. These are narrow uh, devices where the 
height difference is much more noticeable as you add more and more liquid. In this way, you can more accurately determine the liquid or the volume of a liquid sample. With bean balances, how these are used is they are literal balances. You are trying to balance one side versus the other. And so by placing a mass on one side, it is no longer balanced. You would be slowly moving masses towards the other end in order for it to equal and be balanced. You generally always want to start with the highest uh, mass first. In most of these, it's the hundreds place, uh, though none of these um, masses actually weigh more than 100 grams. So after seeing that, moving on to the tens place, in this example, when the tens mass is at 60, the beam balance is up. This is underbalanced. There is more mass on the other side than there is on this side. But if you move this weight by one more uh, place, the beam drops down to the bottom. Now it's overbalanced. There is too much weight on this side and not enough on the other side. What that means is the mass is somewhere in between 60 and 70 grams. Next, the same thing is done using the ones place. And at six grams, it's underbalanced, but at seven, it's overbalanced. That means the mass is between 66 and 67. It was more than 60, but less than 70. And 60 plus 6, and it's more than 66, 60 plus 7, less than 67. The last part of, the, of a beam balance is a sliding scale on the front. And you take one of these masses and just move it along until the beam becomes exactly balanced. The, line on the beam itself matches up with the zero mark. And that way you know that it's perfectly balanced on one side versus the other. In this example, I would estimate this as 66.548 grams. But again, the eight is my educated guess. It could be a little more than that. It could be a little less than that. However, it is between these two markings. So you know it is more than 66.55, but less than 66.56. Beam balances are used by balancing the mass on one side with the mass on the other using predetermined individual weights. Starting at a mass of zero, the object to be weighed is placed on the pan. This causes an imbalance between the two sides. To record the mass of the object, the masses are moved incrementally starting with the heaviest. At a mass of 100 grams, the object is still not balanced, indicating that it weighs more than 100 grams. If the weight is moved to the next increment, the beam balance drops, indicating that 200 grams is more than the weight of the object. The mass of the object weighs between 100 and 200 grams. The same procedure is done with the next weight. The beaker weighs more than 10 grams, but less than 20 grams. 
The last mass to move on a beam balance is on the front of the balance and is on a sliding scale. The mass itself is moved along until the object reaches the zero mark and is level. Because the last measurement is performed on a sliding scale, you can read between scale divisions to estimate between the marks. Overall, the mass of this beaker would weigh 114.09 grams. The mass of the 100 weight, the mass of the 10 weight, and the mass on the sliding scale combined. Overall, the object is perfectly balanced. In the first part of the experiment, you're going to be determining the density of an unknown solid. You'll obtain the solid uh, sample and record your unknown code, and then weigh an empty container on the beam balance itself, obtain that mass out to an accuracy or out to a precision of 0 0.01 grams. Then you'll add the solid sample and measure the combined mass of the two. And by subtracting that, you can determine the mass of the solid object itself. To determine its volume, you'll be placing uh, it in a graduated cylinder. First, you'll fill the graduated cylinder with approximately 30 milliliters or so of just regular water. And you're going to record what is the exact volume of that water. Then when you add the solid sample inside the graduated cylinder, the water level will increase and the difference in that water level will be the volume of the solid object. Since you'll have both the mass of the object and the volume, these two measured properties, you can then calculate the property of density, which is the mass divided by the volume. You'll run through that whole setup, that whole uh, experiment or that whole uh, measurement three different times. You'll obtain the mass and then the volume, dry off the solid, and then obtain the mass and volume again, dry it off, and then the mass and volume again for a third time. In doing it this way, you're introducing a little bit of variability in these measurements. You'll notice that as you weigh the solid object each of these three times, it most likely is not going to be the exact same measurement every single time. The same would be true in the volume reading. And by calculating the density of each of the three trials, and seeing that variability, you can then obtain an average density. You can, obtain it, you can obtain individual deviations of that density, which is just the trial value minus the average value, and then obtain the average deviation, which is the average of each of those three deviations in their absolute value form. So ignoring any of the any negative signs, you can just take the average of those three deviations. All three of these measurements or all three of these statistical properties are still going to have the units of density, grams per milliliter. In the first part of the experiment, you're going to be determining the density of an unknown solid, and you'll determine the density three times to obtain an average and deviations. In the lab, you'll obtain an unknown sample and record the unknown number. You can then start by taking the mass of the unknown solid. The density is a calculate a property based on the measured property of mass
and the measured property of volume. To obtain the mass of the, the unknown solid, you'll first need to obtain the mass of an empty beaker by placing it on the balance and moving the appropriate weights you can see what the mass of the empty beaker is. You want to wait until the balance is balanced at the zero mark. With the tens weight on the number 10, I would read this mass as 14.31 grams for the empty beaker. Once the mass of the empty beaker is obtained, you can then place the solid object into the container and find the new mass of the combined beaker plus the solid object. Again, waiting for the mass to stabilize, and you can obtain the final mass reading of the combined empty beaker and unknown object. With the tens weight on the 40, I would read this as 48.05 grams for the combined mass. With the mass of the empty beaker and the combined mass obtained, you can subtract the two and obtain the mass of the unknown object inside the beaker. In this case, with an empty beaker mass of 14.31 grams and a combined mass of 48.05 grams, by subtracting the two, the mass of the solid object is 33.74 grams. The next property to obtain for the solid object is its volume. Many times these solid objects will be irregularly shaped and can't necessarily be measured using geometry. When this is the case, you can use what's referred to as Archimedes principle where the volume of water displacement is equal to the volume of the solid. To obtain the volume, you'll add in approximately 30 milliliters of water to your 50 milliliter graduated cylinder. When you do this, please make sure to record the exact volume of water inside the graduated cylinder out to one decimal place. You can then very carefully add the solid object inside the graduated cylinder, being careful not to allow any splashing. The water level has now increased. The difference between the final water level and the initial water level is the volume of your unknown solid. To obtain the density then, you can take your determined mass and divide this by your determined volume. You'll be performing these measurements three times. So in between, make sure you dry off your solid object because you do not want any mass of water to affect your second trial and obtain the mass of this again. You'll, you should notice that there is going to be variation in the exact mass and the exact volume each time. Therefore, there will be some variation in the density itself, 
you'll then calculate the average density of your three trials and a deviation for each trial as well as an average deviation. In the second part of the experiment, you're determining the density of an unknown liquid. And you're going to be measuring this density out to a higher level of significance. For the mass, you're going to be measuring it using a centigram balance pictured here, where all of the mass readings will have uh, a precision level out to 0 0.001 grams. For the volume, you're going to be measuring it using a burette, where the volume measurement would have a precision out to 0 0.01 milliliters. You can measure a burette to two decimal places. You're also going to be determining the density of this liquid using a graphical method. You'll be adding, uh, obtaining the mass of an empty beaker, adding a very precise amount of liquid from the burette, and then obtaining that mass again, that combined mass of the liquid plus the empty beaker. Then you'll add more liquid to a very precise amount and weigh it again, more liquid and weigh it again. You'll add liquid to the same beaker a total of five times. Each time, you're going to be recording the very precise reading on the burette itself and the exact combined mass. So when you do this, you're, able, you're going to be able to graph the total volume that's added on the x-axis versus the mass of that liquid on the y-axis. As the volume is increasing, the mass is also increasing at a specific rate. And how much that mass increases per unit of volume is the density. The slope of the line of your graph, of that trend line, will be the density of your unknown liquid. In the second part of the experiment, you're going to be determining the density of an unknown liquid sample. In this part of the experiment, you're measuring both the mass and the volume to a higher level of precision. You'll be using a, a centigram balance to measure the mass out to three decimal places and a burette to measure the volume out to two decimal places. Initially, you're going to weigh, obtain the mass of a small empty beaker on the centigram balance. Then you'll fill the burette with your unknown liquid. When using and filling a burette, you will want to make sure that the valve on the bottom of the burette is in the closed position, which is perpendicular to the burette itself you can then start to fill the burette. When filling the burette, you should always use a funnel to avoid spilling any of the, sol the solutions. Burettes themselves are read to, uh, to give the volume which is dispensed from the burette itself. When filling a burette, it is easier to at first overfill the burette above the zero mark and then drain some of the volume until it reaches exactly zero. While a burette is easier to start at the at the zero mark, it's not necessarily needed to start exactly at zero every single time. You just need to be aware what is the starting volume of your burette. In this case, it would be read as 0.00, .00 milliliters.
as liquid is dispensed from the burette, the volume decreases, but the numbers on the burette itself increase. This is the volume that was dispensed or removed from the burette and added to whichever container it's going into. The volume dispensed would be the final reading minus the initial reading. In this case, the final reading is 3.00 milliliters minus the initial reading of 0, 0.00 milliliters. This gives a volume dispensed as 3.00 milliliters. With the mass of your empty beaker obtained, you can then dispense some volume from your burette into the empty beaker. Be sure to record what the initial volume reading is on your burette. You can then dispense somewhere between 5 and 8 milliliters into your empty beaker. Then record the final burette reading out to two decimal places. The difference between the final burette reading and the initial burette reading is the volume of liquid that was added to the beaker. You'll then weigh the beaker again and obtain the new mass. You will do this a total of five times. As you find the mass of your beaker with solution in it, you will then add another five to ten milliliters. Again, recording what was the volume reading on the burette to start and what was the volume reading at the end when you're finished dispensing. And weigh the the entire beaker and its contents again. A third time you'll dispense five to eight milliliters of your unknown liquid and obtain the new mass. And you'll do this a total of five times. You're going to be determining the density of your liquid through a graphical method. Each time you add more and more liquid, the volume is increasing and the mass is also increasing. You'll prepare a graph of total volume on the x-axis versus mass of solution on the y-axis. Remember, all of your mass measurements contain the mass of the empty beaker as well. You will need to subtract this from all of your measurements to obtain the mass of the liquid itself. When you plot this, the mass of liquid versus the volume of liquid, you should end up with a straight line. The slope will have units of grams per milliliter. The slope of your line is the density of your unknown liquid, which you should be able to record out to two decimal places for a total of three significant figures. Once you have those volume and mass readings of your unknown liquid, you're going to be determining the density using a graphical method you're looking at the total volume on the x-axis versus the total mass of the liquid on the y-axis. The volume itself is the volume of liquid that was dispensed from the burette. So whatever your initial burette reading is, you're subtracting that from the final reading, final minus initial. If you didn't start exactly at zero, you need to take that into account and subtract that amount from each of your uh, recorded volumes from on the burette. 
The total mass is the mass of the liquid itself. When you're measuring this on the centigram balance, you're measuring the liquid in a container. And the, uh, the actual value that you measure is the mass of liquid plus that empty container. So to obtain the proper density, you need to subtract the mass of that empty beaker from your individual mass measurements. As with all graphs, they all need to be properly labeled. So that includes things like a, a title with, L, with any relevant information, including the unknown number and axes labels, including what the units are. Um, when you're plotting the trend line through your data, try to make it go through the origin itself. A volume of zero would weigh zero grams. The slope of that trend line then will be the density of your unknown liquid. The slope is change in y over change in x, y rise over run, y value is grams, x value is in milliliters. So the unit of your slope will be grams over milliliters, the unit of density. You'll also notice that in this graph, you are using real measured data. These are not data points from the lab manual or from a book. These are real values that you are measuring in the lab. And with that, the, the data points themselves may not fall exactly, exactly in a perfectly uh, flat straight line. There will be some variation. While the overall trend will be there, the individual data points may vary slightly above or below that trend line. So when you're obtaining the slope, you're obtaining the slope of the trend line itself, not between two individual data points. The last part of the experiment is an in-class activity, and this will be a worksheet that you'll be turning in before you leave the lab. In this, you're looking at the different precision levels of the varying types of instruments available to measure mass and to measure volume and calculating the density for each of these three measurements. Uh, in the lab, you're just going to be measuring the density of water, just regular tap water, but looking at it from, uh, based on using these different measurement devices. First, you'll measure a volume using your 100 milliliter beaker. This is something that you would not do normally uh, in a real life setting. These are very, very inaccurate and it only reads out to one milliliter. That's the lowest uh, level of precision it can read. And because of that, your density will be very inaccurate. You're going to measure a volume with uh, the 100 mil beaker and weigh it on the triple beam balance, which has this uh, precision out to 0 0.01 grams. Next, you'll measure the same water, but increase the level of precision from both the set, uh, mass and the volume. For the mass, you're going to be measuring this on a centigram balance, which can be read out to 0 0.001 grams. And the volume, you'll measure using your 50 milliliter graduated cylinder, which can be measured out to 0 0.1 milliliters. So that will increase the level of precision that your uh, of your calculated density. Last, you're going to be using a burette to measure the volume. And in this case, it's a very precise volume measurement out to 0 0.01 milliliters. And you're going to use one of the digital microbalances around in the lab room to measure the actual mass. 
and this can measure the mass out to 0 0.0001 grams, having a very precise measurement of the density. So in this first measurement, in all, or at least in all of them, you're measuring the mass by difference. This is a liquid sample and you can't put the liquid directly onto uh, the balance. So it needs to be in a, a container. So when you're weighing these, uh, this water, you need to know the mass of that container itself. So in the first measurement, uh, you're going to obtain the mass of an empty dry beaker on the triple beam balance. And then using the very inaccurate 100 milliliter beaker, measure out 20 milliliters of water, record what you believe uh, that volume actually is, pour that into your weighed container, obtain the new mass. You can subtract those two mass readings to obtain the mass of water. And then using your measured volume, you could calculate what is the density using these uh, devices. In the second measurement, you're again weighing by difference, but using the centigram balance, that higher level of precision. You will weigh an empty container, a clean, dry container and then measure out about 20 milliliters using your 50 milliliter graduated cylinder. This is a higher level of precision and uh, much more realistic than measuring it through a beaker. You'll add that to uh, your empty container, obtain the mass again, and by subtracting the two readings, you can obtain the mass of your water sample using that mass and your measured volume from the graduated cylinder, you can calculate the density using these measuring devices. In the third measurement, this is the most accurate. And you're going to be using the digital microbalances. And because these balances are so accurate, they can even pick up the mass loss from the water evaporating, especially if it's a little warmer out. So when you're obtaining the mass, obtain the mass of a beaker and a watch glass covering the top. The watch glass is what looks like a giant contact lens. So you'll obtain that total mass and then using the burette, you will dispense 20, approximately 20 milliliters from the burette into your pre-weighed container and then obtain the new mass. You'll have the container with the water in it. You'll cover that with, uh, with the watch glass and obtain the new mass. By subtracting the two mass readings, you can obtain the very accurate mass of the water inside the beaker and using the very accurate volume of water dispensed from the burette, you can calculate what is the accurate density of the water. So in summary, you're obtaining the density of an unknown solid. You're using a triple beam balance and measuring by difference to obtain the mass of this unknown solid. You're using a graduated cylinder with water and using water displacement to obtain the volume of that unknown solid. Using the mass and the volume, you can obtain the density. You're going to perform that measurement three different times. So that way you can uh, determine an average individual deviations for each uh, measurement, for each trial, and the average deviation. For the unknown liquid, you're going to be filling a burette to dispense a very accurate volume and obtaining a mass of that volume on a centigram balance. You're going to 
determine the density of this liquid by a graphical method. You're going to add an amount of liquid to that beaker in five different increments. Each time you're adding more and more liquid and the mass is increasing by a certain amount. Every time you weigh the container, there's more volume and the mass is increased. So this way you can graph that in terms of the added volume on the x-axis and the sample mass on the y-axis where the slope of that trend line is the density of your unknown liquid. In both of these uh, parts of the experiment, there are points based on the accuracy itself. So make sure you're measuring things carefully as you go through and obtain the mass and obtain the volume of, the, uh, of these different materials. The last thing is that in-person uh, precision activity that you're going to be doing in lab. You're going to obtain the mass of an empty beaker and then add a very inaccurate amount of water using a 100 milliliter beaker and obtain the mass again. This way you can determine the density of water using these types of methods. You'll do it again using a centigram balance and a to measure mass and a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder to measure the volume. So this is a higher level of precision for both measurements meaning the density is a higher level precision. And last, you're looking at measuring the mass using a digital balance, which can read out to 0 0.0001 grams, and looking at the volume from a burette, which can be read to 0 0.01 milliliters. In this case, you can determine a much more accurate density. Overall, this experiment looks at the measured properties of volume and mass and determines the calculated property of density. All of this looks at the different units associated with the different measurements, as well as the different levels of precision that different instruments can measure.